That should make you feel romantic. You got my back. You feel romantic? <laughs> Good. Okay, is it warm enough, or how is it? Okay, you tell me. You tell me. Okay, is it time? Uh, yes, it's time, and I am the time. That's good. Okay, so I have it all orderly here. Here are few by Hannes. Do we get the translations? Yeah, they're coming. They're on they're their coming. way. They should okay, be here on the. So 20th. that's Hannes. That's a little part, but there's much more, many more. That is Habermas here. That's us over here. So now we have a nice trinity there, and this is our. Everybody has a syllabus, right? Everybody has the road map, I hope. Yeah. Okay, so let's see where we are. Uh, let's see, I want to show you. Excuse me, I don't have the syllabus really, but I have the road map. You have it at home? Or? I have a road map, but I don't have, oh, you have the road map. Oh, that's okay. Uh, I want to show you this here, Global Harmony Association. Um, I just applied for the, what is it called, Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, okay, coming? Let's see, let him come in. Yeah. That's amazing, they let him go through. A miracle has happened. Uh, let's see, then we need another chair. Okay, well, um, so I applied, they want to get, I'm a member of this, uh, and they are st stationed in St. Petersburg in Russia, and I have written a lot for them, and now they have applied for the Nobel Prize for this book there, it's more than that, because they are for universal peace, uh, universal oh harmony. So I let this go through. Tremendous. Oh, you yeah. found us. My, my, my. Very good. So now we really need a chair, right? Yeah, I will get the chair. Uh, get it from the kitchen, maybe, or from Cairns room, or... Okay. Hi, you made Hi. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and uh, let you come in, huh? Yeah. Okay, so we will get a chair. You can also sit over there. And Dustin can no, sit oh somewhere oh else. Oh, no, no, you get a wonderful chair. Everybody has the right to a chair. It's a human right. Okay. Rudy, would you like this overhead light on a little bit? Yeah, right, we have to put that on. Yeah, it's over there, it's the round yeah. one there. Okay. Was it hard to find us? Uh, no, I, mean, I thought it's the first house. Yeah. Well, I saw it like no, in the dark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then you have to put your name in here then too. So that you can get your grades today. Wonderful. Okay, we are in the third discourse today. And welcome to our new member. We are growing. That is good. And um, this is the third discourse today. And let me see what the theme is. We want to proceed as orderly as possible. Political ideals. So uh, these titles of the discourse are in your syllabus. It follows directly your syllabus. So whatever we want to do there, the text is already in the syllabus. The syllabus is our textbook. We don't have another textbook. Okay, we want to start out always with contemporary issues. Um, that is our starting point. And we want to see if there happens something where the pathology of reason is somewhat visible or not, depending on it. So this is what our course is about, right? Pathology. Pathology is the talk about illness. So pathology belongs really to medicine. It belongs to the human organism on your road map there. You can see human organism. So if something is wrong with that, we call that pathology. So when you go to the medical studies, you, uh, uh, you have to study um, the, the structure of the body, physiology, anatomy, and then comes pathology. And something similar we could say in sociology too. We have to presuppose somehow the anatomy, the system, uh, social system, and uh, the physiology, how it functions, and then comes the pathology if it doesn't function. So the structural functionalist name for that is dysfunctionality. That is something how we could approach it for the moment, but we will have more attempts to see what this pathology may mean. Because we don't want to say politically simply to the other party, you know, you Republicans, you are sick, or you Democrats, you are sick, or whatever. Today there was a hearing 
uh, of the Secretary of uh, State there, and she was attacked by the Republican and was just <coughs> furious back and forth and so on. Is that really healthy or is that sick or whatever? Uh, but we want to have a more precise concept what that may mean when we take that word pathology, talk about illness from that level of human organism and apply it to a family where we say the family is sick or whatever, or civil society or the state or the historical process or international relations, North Africa now and so on. So we want to be very precise and very scientific and not use it, you know, as a bad word. So is there anything, um, there is of course, we had the uh, Martin Luther King Day um, and uh, we had the president giving his inaugural, the second one, speech there, of Palmer's second term, opens in a lower key and so on. So is there something which we, um, uh, there you have a wonderful thing which maybe looks healthy. That's the German chancellor. He <laughs> doesn't <laughs> 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 well. sleeves somewhere. <laughs> and the Spiegel, that comes from the Spiegel, which is a left-wing journal, and she is a right-wing ca- chancellor, so therefore they took that miserable picture of her, <laughs> which is very unjust. And it says, Frau verleih nix. Verleih means to, uh, to give loans. So because she gave these loans to Greece, and um, to bail them out. And so the German taxpayers are very upset about that, but they do it anyway. And the Greeks are very upset about it because they uh, they impose on them all kinds of uh, rules, how they have to behave and uh, a very poor life and so on. So the Germans are angry because they have to pay the tax. The others are angry because with the taxes which they get, there are these sacrifices uh, connected with it, so that is what it, what it means there. <laughs> okay, and then we have, of course, journalists like the Spiegel who concentrates on pathology. <laughs> they have a great joy to uh, to find out what may be sick in a society or why she is sleeping there, and so on. So, okay, so nevertheless, is there anything um, <coughs> in, let's see, in the president's speech? Uh, so there we have a text, right? We can text, and we can analyze this text. We do operate on the analytical level, on the empirical level of facts, analytical level, and we want to move even to a dialectical level in order to see what this pathology may mean. So, um, well, is there something which the President said which may be of interest for us? That means something which may have something to do with pathology in any way. That's what we are looking for. We don't have to find something always, but uh, in case uh, we notice something. (coughs) He made a statement. Yes. On this global climate change, this global awareness. Yeah. uh, It was, would that qualify? He mentioned that, yeah. That was one of his program points there. But not what you're looking for. I guess. Do you think? Do you remember what he said about this? Well, I, I believe, yes, he was looking at it as a global issue, but that we had to play our part right. in as much as we are such mega consumers right. that have such a huge carbon footprint. Right. But, I mean, what would be pathological in this? So it's the ecological problem, right? And we are a little bit behind. We, we put torpedoed the Kyoto Treaty, you know, and now True. recently again, and so... We are a little bit back with all of this, and he wants to bring people forward and so on. But, okay, I mean, there are some people who think it's true, you know, man-made damages in the ozone sphere, and therefore it gets, uh, we have more storms, uh, the storm along the east coast, and it gets colder or warmer and so on. And other people say, well, that's just a cycle. We have to look at the calendar, and it always happened, and so on and so on. But, um, I mean, reasonable people uh, can agree or disagree about those things, and uh, so we don't want to call those people who say nothing is really happening, you know, to, uh, we are not at fault, we didn't do that to nature, nature does that by itself all the time. So if there's a new ice age coming, well, it comes in certain rhythms, you know, it has nothing to do with our um, with our industry or our smokestacks or whatever. So. Uh, so f- maybe some people would say, you know, 
of this denial, this not looking at the facts or whatever, is something pathological in a certain sense. But we have to see, you want to be fair, you know. Uh, those people say, you know, things like that happened all the time in a certain rhythm or so. They have to be listened to, but they have to prove it, of course. So, and in a logical and in an empirical way, then we would say this is a healthy argument, you know. And the others, if they have enough material and evidence and so on, and are not just emotional about it, uh, then we could also say there is nothing pathological about it. It's um, both sides can have good reasons for their position. So, for the moment, let's uh, let it stand there. You know, um, is there anything else? The president said something about uh, absolutism. Absolutism. Uh, he said. They mistake absolutism for principle. That is, of course, a very lawyer. He was a law uh, professor in Chicago and law guy in Harvard, I think, and studied Columbia and so on. So it's a little bit complicated thing. So, but what does he mean with absolutism? Uh, one thing it could mean something like extremism, and there we would come more to a pathological. Thing. And even there we have to be careful, you know, when we use extremists. Are all extremists, are they really pathological? Um, Mohammed was an extremist in a certain sense. If you think, you know, of the polygamy, uh, not polygamy, not, oh my God, no, not polygamy, but polytheism, on the Arabic Peninsula or so, at his time when he stood up for this one God or so, some people may, and was very consequential, some people may have said that's an extremist, you know, Jesus, you know, Nazareth, you know, people would say this is a very extreme position, and some people would say, well, it's sick, you know, or people would say, well, either he was the son of God or he was ill, and his family thought he was ill, um, you know, his brothers came and they wanted to take him home because they thought there was something mentally wrong with him, and also most of his brothers never believed in him, so... Um, Sometimes one doesn't know, uh, you know, what is pathological or not. <coughs> you have conformists. You have three groups of conformists. You know, uh, one is a conformist to nonconformists. I mean, nonconformists. So you have nonconformists, uh, the, the criminal. And usually, people differentiate between somebody sick is pathological and who is a criminal. And then you have people who are nonconformists because they're really ill. They're mental cases. They are in the state hospital up there and so on. Uh, and then, but then you have also idealists. Uh, you have people who, for ideals, uh, are nonconformists. If a society is very excited uh, and very anxious and very fearful, they may mix all that up. And they may say that Malcolm X, you know, that Martin Luther King and so on, they are criminals or they are insane or whatever. So the ideal guy who wants to improve society, the guy who is ill and the guy who is in prison, all three forms of nonconformism shrink together and uh, people treat them. We had in the 60s or 70s that happened a lot uh, where people made no difference between that and called, you know, a guy who wants to have a new society uh, a criminal, and they were court procedures at Chicago 7, and so on. Uh, or they would say, you know, they were mentally ill or whatever. <laughs> so therefore, we have to be very careful and differentiate this. Pathological, an idealistic person, mm -hmm. or a criminal or so, are different cases, and we don't want to mix them up. So this, um, what he really meant with absolutism concretely was that his opponents of the gun lobby uh, absolutize the second uh, the second amendment to the constitution by um, which uh, one of the fathers of the constitution introduced there and that was Madison um, and so what he says they absolutize the second commandment <laughs> second amendment, <laughs> yeah. The second commandment. Well, certainly that absolutely. brings us to something which I want to say a little bit later. Uh, political fundamentalists and religious fundamentalists uh, have that in in uh, have that in common that they absolutize things, and we have to see what that means. Absolutizing means 
that you take a text out of the context, you forget that it was created in a particular context, and that in the meantime that historical or whatever context has changed, and therefore the text also is not valid anymore, or is not true anymore. So, And then that is what comes close to, to extremism too. So, But let's go step by step. So, the president only said they mistake uh, absolutism for principle. Well, just one sentence out of the whole speech. And the gun uh, uh, lobby, why do we took it up? They knew they were meant. So, the president didn't say anything about who was meant. But they were meant, and that means he told them that they um, do this Second Amendment, they absolutize it. So, what is the text of the Second Amendment? A well regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That is Madison's formulation. And that was formulated together with the other fathers of the Constitution in Philadelphia in the context of the uh, War of Independence. It was only by 1800 it was called the Revolution. And I would say today it never was a revolution. If we define a revolution as the overthrow of one class by another class, or the overthrow of the final class without any other class, ruling class coming, which was Marxist utopia, or uh, anarchist utopia, so, um, then, um, of course, that was not a revolution, because it was the struggle for independence of the American bourgeoisie and not the workers and not the slaves or whatever, but the American bourgeoisie in Boston or in New York or whatever from the British bourgeoisie because the British bourgeoisie was represented in Parliament and they wanted to be represented in Parliament. Behind that was the, the problem that um, the, in antiquity the colonies have the same rights like the home country. So when we go to Dubrovnik in April or so, Dubrovnik was an Athenian colony, and the citizens of Dubrovnik had the same rights like the citizens in Athens. So there was no problem. But in the modern colonies, like also Algeria, where this trouble is starting now, and in all these uh, uh, North African former colonies and so on, they didn't have the same right. They had their own bourgeoisie, but this bourgeoisie was not represented in Parliament, and they refused here to send taxes to England as long as they were not represented in Parliament. That is the first Tea Party, not the one now that is in, uh, you know, has follows this pattern. And so, so, so that um, uh, th- th- was therefore not a revolutionary war. war. It was, uh, but nevertheless, that was the context of a war of independence where the bourgeoisie in the colonies separated itself from England, from the mother country, because they did not enjoy the same (coughs) rights and therefore they didn't uh, want to fulfill their obligations. They connected their obligations of paying taxes with their representation in, in the British Parliament. So and that's a very specific uh, uh, context now, because the homeland then tried to this disobedient bourgeoisie in the colony to subjugate them, and they sent troops there. And uh, what was it? 1812 was the last time. So that was written here before 1812. So there was always the idea that the British would come back then. And then, of course, there were also Indians who uh, became uh, sometimes attacked and so on, so that was another thing. So we just want to make sure that the certain text is written in a certain context. This is then also the means how high a criticism of the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita and the Holy Quran and so on takes place, right? A very dangerous thing because it relativizes the texts. And uh, fundamentally, religious fundamentalism now cuts that off and deals also, and so does this political fundamentalism, the gun control people, um, they cut it off from the context. Because if the context then changes, up to now, from 1800 to now, uh, then of course is the text still valid? Or that the truth does not become truer in time, but it may get lost in time, the truth, if it is connected, you know, with the, with the 
context. So, and you can say how that in the culture wars uh, takes place now. So, for instance, the book Leviticus plays a role all the time. Man should not lay with a man like with a woman. Um, so, and the fundamentalists cut that off from the context. On the other hand, the so-called, let's call them liberals in a religious sense, liberal Protestant theology or so, or Jewish theology, they would say, no, that was connected with a particular context, namely male temple prostitution in matriarchal temples in the Near East or whatever. So it aimed at this specific situation, and the situation does not exist anymore. Therefore, this text has lost its normative power. And there are other things in there, animal, uh, sex with animals and whatever, uh, which are never quoted, really. It's just this one concentration on this one. But what they want to say is that all the laws in Book Leviticus are connected to some specific context, historical, political, economic, and so on, which is no longer valid. And that is, of course, dangerous, you know, when you think yourself into an absolutist type of an ethics. That means the Lord has spoken, and he has spoken for all times. There is already the core of fundamentalism is there. He has spoken for all times. So the movement of times and changing context and so does not play any role. So that is the, the issue which we have in politics with the president here, and which we have also in religion. And it is possible that the same guy is a fundamentalist in politics and in religion. We would have to look empirically if all these gun people who are political fundamentalists are also religious fundamentalists. But we don't know that. But it would be a nice project for a dissertation if that connects. And we can, you know, we can somehow suspect that there may be a connection. Okay, so... It seems like you're, like, imposing an alien system here. If you're going to have normative categorical prescriptions mm -hmm. and then you're going to contextualize them, mm -hmm. what you've done is you've de-universalized them. Yeah. You've taken them. You relativized them. You, you said that they like basically you're saying they're not valid based yeah. on a principle not held by the people who wrote the, the If they're going to write a categorical prescription, how do you disarm that with kind of relativizing argument? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the president says they are mistaking uh, absolutism for principle. They take absolutism for principle. Wrongly, they take absolute for principle. For they pr don't. Or the principles. So I'm wondering in, if, if the Constitution is a relativizable yeah. Yeah. document and not a categorical kind of prescription, mm -hmm. Then, right. why is it taken seriously as the basis of our law if mm -hmm. it's well, mutable? That is exactly what the gun club would say. You know, the gun people would say that means the president charges them that they are taking something uh, for that they take this for absolute. That is wrong. That means the president is not a political fundamentalist, and he is probably also not a religious fundamentalist neither. So, um, and the gun people will say, you relativize all that, you are against the Constitution, you are ruining our Constitution, right? So, I mean, we have two positions there, we don't want to say now which one is right, you know. But um, the, the people, and maybe the gun people will not be the only ones who will be upset. So, the only thing what we know is the President does not take the Second Amendment as something absolute. That means as something relative. It came up during the campaign where Ron Paul um, or somebody else, another Catholic before him, uh, they talked about absolute and relative uh, um, separation of church and state. There was something else there. And they charged Kennedy with having had an absolute separation of church and state, which meant that the state would not listen at all to what the church has to teach in terms of ethics and morality and so on. So there this word absolutism came came up there. <coughs> and so you know, religiously you could say on one side we have people who are still taking today the Ten Commandments as something absolute, and the 
extreme against that is situation ethics. So in one case, you exclude all the situations. In the other hand, you make the situations into all what decides, the only thing which decides. Uh, so an American pragmatism would be connected with that. So you would, um, you know, from situation to situation. And then you have some middle position where you still consider something to be absolute and other things not. That is Tillich, for instance, you know, who has a close relationship to our department here. Paul Tillich thought that there was one absolute, and that was love. And that love would be valid under all circumstances. And by love, you had to decide what the other Ten Commandments how they had to be understood. So it could be that committing adultery was against love, and then it was bad. But it could also be that adultery was a matter of love because of terrible situations in the marriage. Something had gone wrong or whatever. Um, so the you should not commit adultery was not absolute. But love was absolute. And if you could prove that adultery was the result of love, it was good. If it was the violation of love, it was bad. And so with stealing, so with killing, and, and all of this. So that means, um, uh, uh, so I mean, this is the position. So we have two extremes. We have the absolutist position, and there are people who hold on to it. Roman Catholicism, probably one of the most outstanding people there, Muslims, Jews, and so on, other those Jews do the same thing. And then you have the extremely modern position, on the other hand, where you have uh, situation ethics, which came up in the 60s and 70s. And uh, then you have something in the middle where you say, uh, part the one thing we have considered absolute, that is, you have to love your neighbor, you have to love yourself, you have to love God and then do what you want to. Uh, that was St. Augustine already. Love and do what you want to. And But then there is another position further to the secular side where there is no um, no absolute left at all anymore. Everything is relative. So, But we don't know what the president thinks about all these things. We only know that he does not take the second amendment as an absolute. And I would say that this will be true probably for other amendments, namely the first one, the freedom of speech. He has been called an idiot. He has been called a socialist. Um, he has been called uh, a foreigner, a uh, Muslim, uh, whatever. Um, there have been tremendous abuses against him in Congress. People said, you're an idiot, you know. Um, but also in the press, freedom of press. And the question is, you know, is the First Amendment so absolute that it can be used all the time, or are there exceptions where it cannot be used? Namely, shout fire in a movie theater and drive people into a panic or whatever. Uh, can you um, call people to rise up? Uh, the gun club, by the way, you know, there are some aspects of it where they want to keep their weapons uh, against the, uh, <coughs> their own government. That means some kind of a call to insurrection and so on. Now, uh, does the fir first amendment, you know, does it cover that? We had a wonderful Jewish scholar here in the philosophy department, and whenever we had some Nazis coming up here, he was amazingly tolerant. That means he he thought that all these rights, the fascists or the communists, that they all should have all these rights. That means even fascists who would undermine the rights of free speech or whatever if they would come into power. It didn't bother him. Uh, th that wasn't some kind of an absolutized, absolutist position. And so, so, okay, so uh, uh, now about the other amendments or whatever, or the Constitution itself, um, I think that um, the president, you know, and modern people in general would have a historical view of this. They would say this is the third estate, um, the bourgeoisie, and they produced those uh, constitutions in England and in France, and so it developed. It is a class thing, and uh, as they came to power, they guillotined the clergy, the first estate, and the second estate, and 
feel included. We very often are not sensitive how exclusive things are. I mean, so there were the Jews there. It was Avers, for instance, the widow of Avers, you know, a wonderful woman. You know, if you know Avers, he meant a lot for me when, when it happened. He, he was assassinated in the entrance of his house, and was going into the garage and so by these uh, white guys there, so the Ku Klux Klan, Ku Klux Klan people, yeah. Oh, and she's still alive, and she spent her whole life, you know, to continue the work of her husband. And she uh, said the invocation, and I think in this invocation, Jesus was mentioned. <coughs> so now every Jesus guy, every Christian says, fine, wonderful thing. But it hurts the Jews when you mention Jesus, you know. It does not hurt the Muslims because he is a messenger, and so he's somewhat included. But And then many Jews have become enlightened and there are masses of books written by Jews and rabbis in the 20s and the 50s and 60s again where they uh, really own him as a son of uh, their people and, and so on so <coughs> but there are still you know rabbis who do not feel good about this when you, and they feel excluded but Katya said you know but what about the Buddhists what about the Jainists what about the Taoists you know and so on all the texts which were written there quietly and silently excluded them. Uh, and uh, and if you are a mainstream, you know, Protestant or Catholic or whatever here, you just don't notice it. it uh, I needed Katya to say, you know, how exclusive this whole celebration was, which to me you know, looked quite inclusive, you know. We got a Protestant, there were Catholics, there were Muslims, there were but, you know, the three Abrahamic religions is still not all. There are 10,000 religions, you know, and these are only three of them. And where are the others, you know? So, Shintoists, where were they? And you know, we're not there, right? So, so, therefore, if you think of relativization of the Constitution, you know, <coughs> it was produced, you know, uh, well, it was produced with the help of the First and the Second Estate. They were clergymen, they were bishops who helped to, uh, with the encyclopedists to develop this type of a constitution. They, they were not these medicines guys just getting together, you know, and making that up. So there was a long tradition, at least of 100 years, where these constitutions were formed and shaped slowly. So um, if you take this historical view, it becomes automatically relative. And you see, it has a universalist language, you know, all people and so on and so on. But we know the slaves here were not included, you know, Jefferson slaves were sitting outside, he didn't even free his own slave wife, and his own slave children, and so on. So, uh, so the, it, uh, it belongs, you know, to a particular location, to a particular time, to a particular class, which produced this, and presents it then as universalistic, or as absolute, which is not for all these people who are excluded. It is certainly not absolute. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's for the Constitution itself. Does it therefore mean that it is not valid? You see, I mean, the churches always present their messages in an absolutist term because they say, if you say, you know, it's relative and that law could not be a law tomorrow anymore, why do want people want to obey it, you know? A specific case is uh, the... Uh, the culture war issue, you know, of, of contraception. The, um, uh, the John the Twenty Third brought in a commission, and the commission said, you know, we uh, two to one. There was a kind of a two guy, a doctor among them. Uh, two to one, yes, Catholics can use contraception with a good conscience, and so on and so on. But then the Pope, Part Six, the next one, wrote an encyclical and cancelled it all again. And the argument was, people will lose their faith when we preach something for 2,000 years, and then suddenly we change it. Now, they could have said, look at the new situation, we have overpopulation, the capitalistic ruling class paid $10 million, we have now the pill, the pill is safer, we can now be good Malthusians, we can the first time do what we really wanted to do all the time, because now chemistry is better than morality, we can replace morality, morality by chemistry, and so uh, that is the new context, you know, in this new context we make that change, 
But the Pope's understanding was that people would then distrust the Church. They would say, you know, you told us this all the time, and it wasn't true. So, uh, naive in a good sense, believers uh, see it that God gave them that law forever, and that is eternally valid, and it has always been valid, and will always be valid, and then comes this historical type of view, which is relativistic, and they say that you are relativist. And this, to be a relativist, that's a bad thing, right? So here we have a concrete uh, thing. But what really happened is that people lost their faith because he did not change. <laughs> that, that was a peculiar type of a thing, you know, because the uh, while that was in, in, in conversation, as they said, uh, millions of Catholic women did already go on the pill, and they would not go off it, and therefore... When this encyclical came out, Humane Vitae, they just uh, ignored it and uh, were upset and uh, became liberals. What right does the Pope have to go into my bedroom? And so suddenly he had a, a whole constitutional crisis, which is still going on, and more and more people didn't go to confession. That's why the hell should I go to confession, you know, when I do it anyway, again. And um, even when they tried, you know, the emergency break, and they brought something in which they had repressed since 700 years, namely since Thomas Aquinas, the doctrine of the uh, erroneous conscience, which was, you know, directed against the substance thinking of Aristotle and Plato and maybe Hegel too or whatever, um, then it was too late. Uh, people, you know, what it said, what to Thomas Aquinas taught was, you have to follow your conscience. You will not be judged on, on on Judgment Day with the universalistic teaching of the Church, but your conscience is decisive. If your conscience tells you the Church teaches the wrong thing, you cannot follow the Church's teaching. You have to follow your own teaching, your own conscience. You have to follow your own conscience. And uh, But people were also upset because it was called erroneous. They said the Church said erroneous because it deviated from its teaching. But the people who had this conscience, they said, how can it be erroneous? My conscience tells me the truth. So it's not erroneous. So that was something, and so it has not been settled up to now. And I was in a movement where we wanted to find some kind of a mediation way. Uh, my argument is still, and I have written it in, in a recent book there, that these thinkers, these moral guys, moral theologians, that they should not act, uh, not think on the level of the organism, but rather on the uh, a level of the family, because when they use on all, you know, on top of all of that, an Aristotelian biology, which is really somewhat obsolete, which is teleological, then the organism, of course, as the child, the procreation, is the main purpose. Why the organism exists and eats and drinks, sex is the highest act which a biological organism can do. So that's how they argue. They say, Procreation is the purpose of the organism, and everything what else, what you do, masturbation, whatever, is all perversion because it doesn't follow that teleology, this biological teleology. So I tell them all the time they should not be biologists, but they should be theologians because they have no idea about biology. But if they would go to the level of marriage and family and so on, then they could say marriage is foundation, property, and then the education of children. That is the purpose. And if the property is enough, not enough, and people are poor and so on, they cannot have more than they can educate or whatever in order to give them a starting chance and so on. So um, then one could have said, keep the family open in principle for the child, but not every sexual act which belongs to the organism. That's how they ar ar argue that every sexual act uh, uh, must be open for procreation and that only the biological rhythm, which sometimes does not allow for procreation, that should be used. And then in Kalbasu too, they had all these calendars and they followed these calendars. And there was a doctor whose wife was praying that they had the right calendar and then they had all the Klaus Ogino babies, that were how it was called, the Klaus Ogino method, and so on. So um, all this confusion, you know, could be, uh, could be put aside if they would simply, on 
ontological, they would move to another ontological level, not the social organism, but the family. And in a certain sense, you know, the, um, the biological level is superseded into, or Freud would say sublimated, uh, to the level of the um, of, of family, the fam from, uh, the family. So, and then they could say, you know, the biologically, of course, the, the not every act has to be open, but the family as such, it belongs to it as a goal. The goal of the family is the child. That is still true, but not how many children, or that this has to be regulated on the biological basis. So, but they didn't. Go, uh, they didn't follow this. They rejected this uh, <coughs> this proposal, you know, as an alternative, which would have made the whole thing much easier. As a matter of fact, it would have removed the whole problem, you know, because usually people. But there are there are people who think, you know, that if they have a marriage, it's already a family because they replace the child with a cat, or with two cats, or with two dogs, or three cats, so, but it's not a family. A marriage is not a family. A marriage is the starting point of a family. As a fellow, the first kiss continues the whole family story already, but it is not yet a family. And so the, the devastation which we have now, you know, that there are um, all the, well, like me, myself, you know, one parent families, I raised my guys there after the death of my wife, and so alone, so that is irregular or whatever. And then people have children and they have no property, and you know, well, they had a lot of property and they have no children, and, and, and so on. So um, the, uh, the, there's a lot of, uh, well, structural functionalists would call it dysfunctional or whatever, but that leads us to, to other things which we, uh, which are interesting for these t argued people, they're these Habermas and so on, they are post-metaphysical people. And post-metaphysical people means that metaphysical truth is not valid for them anymore. <laughs> that means they can really only talk about the correctness of protocol sentences. Let me say somebody goes into a social worker, goes into a family, and um, he says this is the family, has the name of the family, Müller or whatever. Then he goes in there and he sees, you know, the husband and wife, they're fighting each other and shouting each other and throw the furniture around and the children are screaming at her. Then they say, this is not a family, you know. Well, it is a family and it's not a family. That means even in the positivist today, there is still a residual of a metaphysical truth. That means he still compares what he sees with the nature, what was called once the nature or the essence of the family. Otherwise he could not say that's not a real family uh, because he has to compare the empirical stuff which is going on with something else, with the nature or the essence or the notion of the family which includes marriage, poverty and children and whatever is missing there, then he says this is not a real family and so on. So these are residuals and um, they would say so, that they are residuals, and would say practically that the metaphysical truth, that when I say Michigan is a culturally failed state, I must have some concept of what the state is in terms of internal state law, external state law, and its historical operations and so on. And then that there are the inner state law is included the education of its citizens. As Socrates had it, when people said to Socrates, you have to live, you have small children, you have to educate them. No, he would say that's a task of the state to ask to, uh, to, um, uh, to educate the children. So it presupposes a certain metaphysical notion of what the state is, or the uh, metaphysical proofs of God, that you have a notion of God even, and you can see what's wrong in the world and so on. But this for all, for, for Hannes and Habermas and so on, that is the past, right? That, uh, that is, they are not absentists. That was a historic period, and with the experience of history and so on, we have left that behind, like court, you know. There was a time of theology, time of philosophy, and now of positive science. And uh, we could even say yes to that if we would take it dialectically, namely that philosophy superseded theology, and science superseded uh, philosophy, but in such a way that it also preserved what is superseded. That means not like the positivists do an abstract negation, but a concrete negation. That's the difference between dialectical thinking and on the right, positivism, thought, and so on. They have no dialectics. That is on the left. But you could uh, straighten out, you know, Kant's position if you would dialecticize it, which some people try to do by saying,
uh, myth which appears suddenly in the sciences. Um, I wrote something for these people there in, in uh, Petersburg there, and I said harmonization in religion and uh, science and philosophy. And they said, but we want to have only religion. But I said, no, we have to take it all together there because uh, that one follows out of the other, and the newest one contains the other still in itself. So, well, nevertheless, let's go back to this thing here now. Absolutism, relativism, the president relativizes the Second Amendment. I would suspect that he relativizes also the First Amendment. There are limits to free speech. You cannot simply call you know, state officials, you cannot uh, idiots, you cannot simply say, uh, you know, paint p bad pictures of Mohammed, or put a bomb on the head of Mohammed, or whatever. There are limits. It is not an absolute uh, right, or the First Amendment, or the Second Amendment, or whatever amendment. It is all relative, and it, uh, it is relative, but that doesn't mean that it is not valid. It is just not, has not always been valid, first of all. Um, a good example, again, from Catholicism is the, up to the Council, the Roman Catholic Church taught that slavery is morally acceptable. We don't do it anymore. Up to then, they said that the death penalty is acceptable, morally acceptable. We don't do it anymore. The Pope at least doesn't do it anymore, but many bishops still do. Um, the, um, the, the interest rate, uh, usually, you know, usually was absolute, um, and then suddenly, slowly, you know, the church gave money and got interest and uh, took money and paid interest, and by the 17th century, they suddenly changed it, and it was valid only for 2%. You can pay up to 2% interest or receive it. Afterwards, it becomes a, 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 more, a deadly sin, a mortal sin. Um, and you have to go to confession and so on. But uh, that is a form of relativization. So we have empirically, in all religions, we have that relativization going on. But at every moment in time, it is presented in such a way as if it was absolutist. And that can happen in the political sphere too. Um, the, um, now, how honest these gun people are, but they are not the only ones, you know. Who um, the, the Constitution is part of the inner state law and is the foundation of the state. The family rests on love, that's the foundation. Um, if you bring lawyers in, it's all over. The family's over when the, when the love dies. The dialectics of love arrest, it's dead. Um, the, uh, the civil society rests on the need system. It has to fulfill the need for food and so on. The state rests on the internal state law, which finds its center in the Constitution. So it is really foundational, and therefore I think many simple people, now even a good sense now, um, think that the... Um, that the uh, Constitution is categorical or um, that it is eternal or whatever. And particularly conservative people, you know, if somebody comes and wants to change and say, look, that's the Constitution from the 18th century. Now in the meantime, 200 years later, 300 years later, you know, the civil society has increased unbelievably. And uh, there is this old Constitution and there's this modern type of society. So it's particularly people who are progressive, and the president is a progressive, uh, the progressives who are interested in relativization, and it's the conservative who are uh, interested to fix it so that it stays. But how honest they are about that, you know, is the gun control not really interested in its own income and uses the, um, the uh, Constitution in order to instrumentalize its... Uh, it as a defense and a legitimation of what they want to do anyway. So it's not the holiness of the Constitution which they're interested in, but it is rather the legitimation of their sales. And there are 300 million guns out there, and after the children were massacred, the, the sales went up enormously and so on. So it is a bigger business than porno and, and drugs together and so on. So, um, and uh, that would relativize things, of course. So we never know. Also
what's in the religious realm. We do not know, you know, uh, if somebody uses uh, the Decalogue as a weapon against his enemy, that he is an adulterer, a thief, a murderer, and so on, or if they really take it seriously, so if, if they are honest absolutists. But we can leave that out for a moment. So the, uh, we see that we have a little incident here, just one sentence. They take absolutism for principle. They mistake absolutism for principle. That means you have you can have principles without absolutizing them. That is the president's position. You and that's Harvard position. I think that's the whole liberal jurisprudence position. You can have principles and they are quite some firm, but they must not Absolutism must be not be mistaken, mistaken as principles. That is the issue. So non-absolute relative principle, which rests on the consensus, Rabbi Moss and some of these people would say, it rests on the consensus, and as long as this consensus lasts, they have validity. They get their validity. And so we could mention for a moment the uh, is discourse ethics, right, or communicative ethics which Apple and Habermas have developed, particularly Apple and Habermas learned from him. This is a Kantian position. So let's flip back. All that has to do with secularization, of course, right? So uh, since Immanuel Kant, um, people try to have uh, an ethics without theology, without religion. And um, we will see later on that what we call the pathology of reason has something to do with processes of disunion. And the disunion of the unity of reason and faith, as we have in the Middle Ages, and sometimes in antiquity and so on, or the disunion of the individual and the collective in modernity may have something to do with the pathology of reason. I just throw that out in a certain sense, but it's just hanging in the air. So we have in modernity a deepening dichotomy and antagonism between the religious and the secular, between the individual and the collective, and between right and left. So these three forms of disunion may be a source of what we what they what we are call pathology. Okay. Uh, yes. It seems very strange, from a Marxist perspective, to support gun control in the sense that if you were to say that the working class can no longer have weapons, you would leave weapons solely in the hands of a bourgeois state. Yeah. That doesn't seem very Marxist at all. Well, um, to read this thing here. Uh, what we had, what, what the text is, and it's always good, by the way, if you discuss Bin Laden or whatever, to really go to the text. There are Bin Laden, there are all his speeches and so on. And I don't trust anybody who says bad things or assassins him or whatever, who has never read anything of what, what he said. I would even say that with Hitler, you know. He has written two books, after all, and, and people didn't read them when he was in power. If, he ha if they had read when he was in power, they would have known exactly what he th would do, because the fascist is different from a liberal that he's really doing what he says. <laughs> he's marching to, into Europe, Russia and so on. Why did Stalin, he must have read this, you know. He didn't even believe it when three million people were standing in front of his doors there. So, Okay, so what is the text here? The text is a well-regulated militia. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Okay, now let's take a post-bourgeois position now, right? So the bourgeois position is the monopoly of power and force. The monopoly of force is with the state. So in a normal functioning state, the citizens will trust the state and will therefore see no need to bear weapons uh, alone uh, uh, themselves. We have here a, a state which is just in the process of formation. 
it is still threatened from outside by the British um, and maybe by the Indians or whatever. But in the meantime, that state has become secure. It was secure by two oceans. Um, the, uh, there was an attack on Pearl Harbor, of course, and then was September 11th. That was an attack on, on, the, on the mainland, on the state. Otherwise, the state has to become so powerful that, um, that there was no need anymore for, uh, for militia running around there or well-regulated militia. If you have a real army, you don't really even need a militia. So now, in Switzerland, we do have militia. Every farmer has this thing. That's another organization of things. But we have, in uh, Switzerland, we have unbelievably powerful uh, state organizations outside, by the way. The sovereignty outside has become enormous, but the sovereignty of the state toward the inside, where the gun controllers are, toward civil society, is not uh, is much weaker. So um, now about let's take the, the Marxist thing. First of all, how does Marx see the state? He takes the idea, the bourgeois idea of the state. I think he um, uh, is, is sure that the state has the monopoly of force, but there's one thing which he mentions, that the state is the tool of the ruling class. So, take an example, in uh, down in the um, Central America there, in one of the Central American states, there was a general who wanted to distribute the land of the United Food Company only that part of the land, of the land, Dominican Republic, no, where was El Salvador. it? Salvador. No, it was not El Salvador, it was the neighbor. Nicaragua. No, not Nicaragua, Honduras. another one. What's, what else is there? <coughs> Honduras. Not Honduras, no. One of these states, and uh, well, it will come to me. So, uh, the, and, and the general wanted to nationalize and give to the Indians only that what the United Food Company did not use. And the United Food Company called up Washington, and Washington sent a few bombers, and they bombed the capital, and then our ambassador went over to the president and said, you have to leave the country, and he went to Mexico. So that is how it functions. That means the businessmen, the ruling class, 2%, uh, the top ruling class, oil companies, etc., they use the state, the police, in order to police inside, so when the sittings in stride in Flint there, then the army came in and uh, made peace and so on. Um, the, so that the, the police has to look for law and order inside and the army for law and order outside. And the ruling class uses this whole state organization as a tool. Marx went on with this and would say that the working class has to gain state power and the working class would then use the state as the bourgeoisie had used it in order to overcome the residuals of the bourgeoisie and create a class of society. That is the dictatorship of the proletariat. And that is what Bakunin, now the Russian nobleman and also uh, the musician Richard Wagner, who was a Bakuninist, and they made a revolution in Dresden together before he became that great composer or so. So, uh, this, uh, uh, he, he was suspicious of that. <laughs> that means he said, if you once, you know, take over state power and have this dictatorship, you never give it up. So there the, the idea, you know, that some, that the proletariat, the 200 million workers here, would take the state power in Washington out of the hand of the bourgeoisie and would use it themselves in order to subjugate the bourgeoisie and establish a working class state or, or then no, a class state or whatever um, uh, that Bakunin distrusted but Bakunin was outlawed by the communist party even by the social democrats he died in Switzerland lonely as a lonely fellow and had no support from anybody so uh, but that would be the, the Marxist position then uh, that socialism goes to different stages, and one stage is this uh, this dictatorship of the proletariat. That means the workers do the same thing with the state, what the bourgeoisie and the feudal lords and the slaveholders did before, uh, for some time, for some time. And then comes this miraculous thing, where this working class state then wins. And when I was in Yalta recently, they 
told me that. They said, well, Marx told us, you know, what, uh, how we get out of the bourgeoisie into socialism. But they didn't tell us, he didn't tell us how we get out of socialism back into the bourgeoisie. I said, well, I mean, he did have something for counter-revolution. I said, you, you just had a counter-revolution. I mean, you lost it all. And you, now you are back where you were before. Not really, it wasn't well developed, but you are now a liberal state, you know, and there's all the chaos and school killing and everything what we had before. I mean, that's what you wanted, you know. But they, um, And Marx said what would happen. You, it will either be socialism or it will be barbarism. So I said, you chose barbarism. Now you have barbarism. Uh, the guy who is now governing just came out of prison, and the guy who governed before she is now in prison, or, or vice versa, or whatever. And corruption all over the place, and no pensions, <laughs> whatever. I mean, all the security which they had before, uh, now they are longing back to this, so they would have the security again. But it's gone. I mean, in Croatia the same way. I, I told them before it happened, and I taught in, in uh, Rostock, and the, the German Democratic Republic, and it was the same thing. They wanted to have a new socialism, and suddenly they had the old bourgeoisie back again, and complained bitterly about it now in all three places. And I'm just sitting there and said, well, you're talking like I did 20 years ago. What was it? too late now, you know, the counter-revolution was won, and so you have to live with it now until you make a new revolution and throw it out again. Uh, but until then, it will go on and on and on, and the rich will get richer, and the poor will get poorer. You knew what, you know, we saw that on the television, everybody had a Mercedes, you know, I said, well, not everybody had a Mercedes, you were just being had, you know. So, um, by, by the propaganda machine and the television was nice, you know, colored picture and everybody so so happy and so, so they fell for it. <laughs> okay, so um, is, that answer, is that an answer to your question or? Well, uh, yeah, to a certain extent, it just seems you know when you look at every Marxist revolution, it's yeah. always been an armed revolution in a sense, or even before that. I mean, how the bourgeois took power from the king it was mm -hmm. with the Bastille, the storming of the Bastille, and they armed the the populace. Yeah. Or um, when Kerensky was fearing that the white Russians were going to invade Moscow and St. Petersburg, so what did he do? He armed the Bolsheviks, and that allowed yeah, them right, to take yeah, power. Right, right, yeah. You know, it, 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 every single revolution somehow has happened with an armed population. And where people mistake, they say, well, look at Gandhi, you know, he got rid of the British, but he didn't have a revolution. And the it, the the overthrow of the British didn't happen in Britain, in their own country. It happened somewhere else. Yeah. They could leave. You know what I mean? So the Col Union Master was overthrown, but not their own ruling class. That's so right. That's right. Yeah. So it wasn't a revolution in that sense, right? So I mean, the <laughs> question then, from a Marxist perspective, is you know, looking at who has the guns here. Is it, is it the Lumpens yeah. who have the guns? In that case, you know, from Marxist perspective, that would be extremely dangerous because they're the ones most identified with their m masters yeah. in that sense because they need those illusions. I mean, the gun people will not make a socialist revolution. But that's right. That's right. And so, in that, from a Marxist perspective, that would be yeah. an issue to look at in terms of the Lumpen pros. Yeah. But in terms of the gun culture in America, it's not a left-right issue. I mean, right. You know, there's a whole lot of, say, Democratic senators, representatives who are getting A plus ratings from the NRA because right. they're for gun rights. Right. So I mean, so it shows once more the relativity, you know, of the second. Amendment, this, uh, all of them, and the, the relativity in that sense, you know, it had that meaning in this context. The British militias at home defending the country and so on. But this context changed, and that must affect the text as well mm -hmm. in the process. And if a revolutionary situation should come about, it would, of course, change the context once more. Because now everything is interpreted, you know, in, uh, I mean, Obama is a liberal, you know, is a bourgeois guy. So, and he would say, you know, all that is not necessary. The state has the monopoly of power. And, but there is the psychology of the people, you know, and I gave you this example already. We had this, uh, when my daughter Jeannie was here, a lawyer in New York, and she was with three children, and she decided, you know, to live in the house here. And then, after she had been here for two days, Suddenly come these 15 cars there with the blue lights and a an horrible noise and so on. And they encircle the whole area here and bring dogs in 
and caught uh, behind that other house there, caught these two guys there, some drug dealers, and they had chased them at 131, and then they came in here, and then they run against them, and they run against the bus, and then jumped out of the car and run here into this area and so on. So, I mean, the police force, and it was state police, so not as much specifically state police now, so they, in a certain sense, you could be impressed by the power of the state. They all drew their weapons, you know, they walked out all over with their weapons, you know. So that was a monopolization of power in the hands of the state, and the state was supposed, did what it was supposed to do, protecting the citizens. Now, it was a very impressive of a not a failed, but a well-functioning type of a state. But my daughter moved out of the house, and she went to the hotel down there, because she was still frightened, and I think masses of American citizens are frightened that the state will not function. Even when the state does function, you know, immediately they have that feeling that it doesn't function. And that is something specifically American or so. Um, it has something to do with spreading out, you know, all these people who are spread over the territory between here and the Lake Michigan. There are innumerable little houses out there, and they say, the police will take 45 minutes. I have to have a gun in my thing, you know, it's four guns, five guns, or whatever. So it has something to do with the huge territory which we have, uh, or the distrust that the police is not adequate or whatever. But the real response would be, you know, to pay more for the state so that it would strengthen its police force, and the police force would be faster. But the strange thing is that even if the police force works, people still have this residual thing, which I don't I haven't found in any other state, uh, I mean, another other country, that fear that the state could not work adequately. Now, with the gun people, they have all these, of course, the, what is it, this, um, what we mentioned before there, this Tea Party thing and so on. So these are right wingers, and we have to think, you know, what the right, the right would have made the same argument, you know. They are afraid, you know, that a democratic or liberal state uh, infringes on their rights, and therefore they have to have weapons, the rednecks and so on, you know. And I'm quite sure a lot of them are in, in that in that club there. But you are right, there is also the left. So. And then we have a situation that masses of people are alienated from their state, alienated from the political machinery, from the parties, and so on. Think that all politicians are rotten and cheaters, and so on, and so on. Uh, so it's an insurrectional, insurrectionist mentality, which may come from the right, and I think the gun lobby it comes from the right, but it could possibly also be from the left. Um, so the, in that moment, they take an absolutist position because the Second Amendment protects their interest at this moment. Um, and um, but uh, you know they may also uh, uh, violate that from the left or from the right if they would rise against the mm -hmm. state. But do they really take an absolutist position on it in the sense that even say the NRA yeah. accepts? certain regulations of guns. Yeah. You know, you can't freely buy a full auto, yeah. full automatic weapon. Uh, there are certain military grade weapons you can't own. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to do some modifications on a weapon that's semi-auto, whatever, you have to get federal government approval. They accept that. They've even accepted universal background checks now. Mm -hmm. So, to say, I mean, if you look at the Second Amendment and how you, you know, if you've read it a few times now, mm. if it was absolute ties, nothing would have been infringed, and what would then be there to stop you from owning a weapon that was fully automatic, like a Thompson, that's actually when after the Thompson killing to Valentine's Day massacre, and was when they outlawed fully automatics for the civilians. You know, in that sense, so we've already accepted a certain amount of regulations or well, interpretation of well, it. That's right, amount, so yeah. it's already relevant. So right now, the, the, the debate is really between two groups that accept that there's you know already some kind of regulation on it. It can be interpreted in a certain way, but to what extent on either way it goes. One wants more regulation on that, and one wants less. But they both accept the fact that it has to be regulated. Yeah, there was a guy today, a lawyer, who spoke for the uh, for the lobby there for this old club there, and he was really, I mean, he he was an absolutist. He didn't want to change anything. He thought even those assault rifles are necessary, you know, when, when you have groups of criminals attacking and so on, you have to mow them all down and so on. So, okay, but we want 
to uh, you know to want to close this thing here to um, uh, the the president sentence. That's what we started out with. You know to mistake uh, uh, principles as absolute, so that one can have uh, relative principles. One can be a principled man. There is obviously you know the guy you know acts just you know spontaneously, right? but other people have principles. Or one is pragmatic and the other one has principles. And so this is a man of principle. So the president wants to have a, be a man of principle. Um, the principle would be social justice or redistribution of wealth or uh, to bring about more equality. Uh, if not real equality, then at least equality of opportunity um, to give individual chance to move out of their class and in spite of the fact that the class remains where it is but you bring people in. So these are the principles. But I mean, he must be honest about himself that also these principles in, you know, are relative um, and may change in time. And I think he would admit this. So we have a secular version here from on the one side to the, pol uh, to the rec to religious type of a thing, you know. Because for some people, you know, the state and the uh, civil religion and may all have an absolute ring. So, you know, the question is, you know, uh, I think one can learn from the religious side what's going on on the secular side, um, because there is uh, on the religious side, the Roman Catholic Church is very absolutist, uh, you know, in, in confession, but not in reality, as we just saw, because they do change. I mean, they really turn it upside down. You know, instead of slavery is acceptable, no slavery at all. Uh, death penalty is acceptable. No, no. So then people, of course, will argue. Well, will they also change their mind on contraception? You know, they change in all other things. So they will take. So they may anticipate what the church will do. They will say the church is so damn it slow. Uh, you know, it has to get its slow learners and so on. So, but why should I make all these sacrifices now of uh, five children uh, when they will change their mind down the road and so on? So. The, uh, that is why the relativism is uh, opposed on the religious side, and that may also be the reason why it's opposed on the secular side, in a certain sense. If it is meant honestly, that means if it's not just instrumentalized, and they say, well, we are now to, we are just for absolutization now because it serves our purpose now, our profit or whatever. But let's assume, you know, that people think honestly. You could also say that's just the cheating of the priesthood. You know, uh, they want to stay in power. They, know the, the guys and, and therefore they are absolutistic and so uh, I mean you can if you are total skepticism you have to turn that skepticism against yourself too if you are a creed and you say all creeds are liars you know they, you include yourself and you just have lied so that means it dis dissolves itself the whole position and it makes no sense in what discourse ends you know you have committed suicide okay do we have um, any other issue here and do we know how that belongs into? So we we discussed that new town thing there, um, and so then the, there's one thing here which we can maybe take up for a moment. This guy Prince Harry there, he came home and he said, "I have killed in Afghanistan, but Dad wants me to act like a prince." <laughs> <laughs> is that the pathological statement, or what is it? Well, what does it mean now? You did. You did. Okay. <laughs> Prince Harry was in Afghanistan, and he flew a helicopter, I think. And uh, he said he had killed Taliban there. And now Dad wants him to act like a prince. So that means a prince should not kill Taliban. What the hell did the princes do? <laughs> the century. Right. They didn't do anything did. else than killing yeah, Taliban true. all over the place. <laughs> they had different names, the Taliban, you know, but they always killed somebody. I mean, yeah, if you think of the Catholic. how many right. people the British nobility <laughs> killed continually, you know, or the French nobility or the German nobility or whatever, you know. So that this, what, what do we say? This is a naive type of a guy or whatever. Um, you know, but uh, if we can, he, uh, as at end of four months, so he killed Taliban for four months. There would be a lot of them. Captain Wales describes his time at Camp Camp Bastion and frustration with sections of the media or whatever. So, well, we don't know much more about this except that the poor guy doesn't know how to get two things together, two opposites together. One is that to be a soldier.
avenger and to kill, and then he must have some kind of an elevated, or his father, an elevated view of what a prince is. In addition to that, he will not be much of a prince because uh, the, they have a constitutional monarchy already that's the Puritan Revolution, and so he has nothing to say uh, and nothing to do neither. <laughs> that's what he means, that he has just a decorative type of a function and is not supposed to act at all anymore, and now they made him act there. And uh, and then, is it the same guy who, who's that guy who married that bourgeois woman now? That was his brother William. Oh, that's the brother William. Oh my God, so he fell out of the whole thing. He's not supposed to have a bourgeois woman. He's supposed to be a noble woman from Denmark, Norway, or Sweden, or whatever. Hanover. <laughs> uh, Hanover, yeah, that's where they all come from. <laughs> so, uh, but, I mean, it's just, and it's the Spiegel, and the Spiegel takes nothing but it says seriously. So, therefore, you know, they, they may have just done that ironically or whatever, but nevertheless, it's here, Prince Harry, I have killed in Afghanistan, but Dad wants me to act like a prince, so it looks a little bit pathological to me, so, <laughs> okay, <laughs> this, then, um, young Syrians disillusioned by revolution, and then, of course, the whole African thing we want to postpone for another time. We don't do that tonight, but uh, look for those things there, right, in order to uh, uh, fill in what we mean there, uh, you know, in terms of pathology. Okay, so do you want to take a few minutes to rest or to have some cookies? Um, it's almost eight o'clock. Where are we? Yeah, so you can make a little rest, have a little rest there and gather your thoughts. Uh, the point which I want to make is let's be in contact with the news, you know, whatever you can, um, on, on the computer there, you can get newspapers. I have the New York Times, the Baltimore Sun, the, and you can take some French papers or German or whatever and see if something comes up there which has something to do with what we want to discuss here. Okay, so that was our first point, and uh, just have a little rest now and see that you, do you have cookies there? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay, five minutes. Ten minutes. You can walk around the house. Stand up. Yes, very good. So you take the Frank Now, what you need is uh, the uh, um, the uh, um, thing there, syllabus. Uh, you can get it out of here, right? Yeah, I went to London and I saw it. You saw it already, okay? So just print out the syllabus.